everyone. Um, we're going to ask that if you are not a panelist, if you could mute and please go ahead and um, hit mute for us. And we'll have time for questions and answers, but we are going to start with an, um, a, a formal um, a formal panel. So welcome. Thank you so Thanks, much sir. for coming today. Um, we really appreciate it. We have some very distinguished panelists today, and I'm going to let them tell you, of, you know, their background and, and uh, what they want you to know about them. But I also see um, we have a candidate for school board in Irvine, Cyril Yu, who has joined us today. Um, we have two candidates, one for Irvine City Council, Lauren Johnson Norris and uh, one in orange, Eugene Fields. So we have a great audience and um, like to just kick everything off. I'm gonna start with our panelists. Gina Clayton Tarvin's gonna tell you a little bit about who she is and her background. Well, thank you, Melissa, and thanks so much. I'm just so happy to be here with all of you today with the esteemed panelists. Um, also, Westminster trustee Jamison Power in Orange Unified School District, uh, Chris Erickson, and my friend and, and um, trustee from Brea, Olinda uh, Unified School District, the clerk, Carrie Crocky. I am Gina Clayton Tarvin. I am the president of the Ocean View School District Board of Trustees, and Ocean View covers uh, the cities of Huntington Beach, um, a part of Westminster, part of Fountain Valley, and pretty much all of Midway City, uh, which is actually the County of Orange. We call it the mythical city of Midway because it's not really a city, but it's called Midway City. But anyway, we love our residents of Midway City and uh, so happy to be here again. Thank you. And uh, besides being the president of the school board, um, I happen to be a classroom teacher. I am a rank and file teacher. I work in LA County in the ABC Unified School District and I teach uh, sixth grade in the gifted and talented education program and I've also taught seventh and eighth grade. So I'm 24 years of six, seven, and eight and then I have two teaching credentials, a multiple subject which is K to 12 and adult school and preschool too. And then I also have a single subject credential in biology. So I'm a biologist as well as a, an anthropologist. Oh, and I've been teaching algebra for years. So anyway, that's my background. I'm um, going to be happy to explain our school reopening and some of my thoughts on how to reopen schools safely as we get into this. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Gina. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Irvine Council Member Melissa Fox. I'm also running for State Assembly in the 68th Assembly District. We also have with us today David Johnson, who is a trustee on the Westminster School Board. So Gina, thanks for that great intro of yourself and the others on the panel. We are now going to go to Carrie Kropke. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Melissa Fox, you are going to be our next assembly member, assemblywoman. So thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me and to be here with all of you this afternoon. My name is Carrie Kropke. I am on the Brea Olinda Unified School District. I'm currently the clerk. I am also an elementary educator. So happy to work in public schools my whole career. Uh, I'm also uh, a single parent. I adopted a little baby. Uh, he's now eight years old. And I was crazy enough to actually go back to school and uh, retrain and become a speech language pathologist. So I also work in the special education department in public in our public school system. And I uh, was also a professional baseball player at one point in my life. So uh, I've done some fun and interesting things and always just thrilled to get up and go to work and be with children and, and uh, work in this great thing called school. Thank you, Carrie. Um, you're at, you are amazing and I love seeing all those baseball pics of you. Pretty great. Um, you're certainly hitting home runs today. I love uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'd like to in introduce my friend Jameson Power who is on the Westminster School Board and is a candidate for Westminster City Council. Hey, thanks, Melissa. Um, first of all, thanks for inviting me to be part of uh, today's discussion and for your leadership on uh, education issues. And I'm really honored to be part of such a esteemed panel with uh, just amazing educational leaders. So thank you. 
Uh, my name is Jameson Power. I'm a school board member in the Westminster School District. We are a K-8 district that serves uh, most of Westminster, a uh, portion of Garden Grove and a portion of Huntington Beach. I was first elected in 2012 and re-elected in 2016. So I'm wrapping up my eighth year on the board and uh, I'm a parent of two small children. So I'm grappling with this crisis on two fronts as a school board member and then as a parent trying to uh, educate uh, my kids at home. Um, and I apologize in advance if one of those kids makes a guest appearance today as they often do that on my Zoom calls. Uh, my, my son actually turns seven tomorrow and uh, he, uh, he's, he'll be going into second grade, and he actually is in our Vietnamese English dual immersion program, uh, which we started during my time on the board, so it's something I'm really proud of. And then my, my daughter's three, and she'll be uh, uh, entering preschool. And uh, in my real job, I am an attorney. I'm in-house counsel for Hyundai Motor America in Fountain Valley. And I just, again, thanks for inviting me to be part of this discussion. Thanks, Jameson. Um, we also have the amazing Chris Erickson. Now, I'm a lawyer. Jameson's a lawyer. Chris is a lawyer. I think there's a theme. But um, we're not here in that capacity today. But uh, Chris is an amazing school board member. She is with the Orange Unified School District. And I'd love to have her tell you a little bit about herself. Sure. Thank you so much for having me today. And congratulations on your campaign. You are doing just a tremendous job. You are everywhere. <laughs> and I love to see it. So thank you for, for stepping up and doing that. Uh, my name is Chris Erickson. I am a trustee in the Orange Unified School District. I was just elected two years ago, so I'm, I'm pretty new to the job still. Um, we're a relatively large district, K through 12, um, serving approximately 27,000 students. We are not just limited to the city of Orange. We actually have, we touch um, parts of Garden Grove. We touch Olive Orange, Villa Park, Anaheim Hills, Santa Ana County. We have a very large uh, geographic area that we touch. I am the product of Orange Unified School District. I graduated from uh, high school there, as did my husband and as did my two kids. So we all went to the same school and went through um, many of the same classes and things like that. I attended UC Irvine where I studied um, social sciences and then I went to law school, as Melissa said. And, and um, I started off, I have a little bit different experience. I started off as a public defender in Orange County and I was a trial lawyer for many, many years. I'm approaching my 28th year practicing law and it has been a job that really inspires me daily to do the job that I'm doing now. Um, for many years, I represented individuals that were largely failed by the system, whether it was the educational system, um, mental health system, the, um, you know, healthcare system, you name it. So I, you know, I worked daily with sort of broken and struggling people and it was, it was heartbreaking. And I feel like now um, being on the school board, I have an opportunity to sort of be on the front end of that and be part of the solution and to be preventative in um, making sure that, that our students don't call, crawl through the cracks because the consequences are not just personal, they're societal. Um, so it's been a very fulfilling job, very challenging, of course, to be a brand new school, school board member in all of this, but I am just thrilled with my new sort of station in life and I love doing it and I love being able to problem solve in this way. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's so wonderful that, that everyone could come together uh, to give us your time to talk with us about the issues that you're facing as school board, board members and trustees. In regular times, it's quite the challenge to set curricula, to deal with budgets, to deal with facilities, um, to deal with you know, shortages. Uh, but now, you have quite the spotlight because so much pressure is on our schools and uh, we have to get it right so that we keep not just the students safe, but their teachers and the bus drivers and the administrators and maintain educational standards in such a complex uh, environment. And so I love, and you all are here because you've been leaders in this, and I really wanted to hear what you're doing. And I know this is of great interest to the public, so we're going to be recording this and posting it for others who couldn't make it today. So I have a few questions, um, and the way we're going to handle it is um, I will 
we, we set the questions out in advance so the speakers know when to expect to be called on. So we're going to have a question for each panelist, but then after the each panelist speaks, other panelists will have the opportunity to also add uh, additional comments um, so that we get to hear from everyone on each issue. Now, we also will have a time for Q&A at the, at the end, and I expect that there will be some questions. So let's start with what's on everyone's mind. Um, what are you hearing? What are some of the issues members of the community have highlighted for you since students started remote learning uh, during the spring? And I think we're gonna ask that of Jameson. Would you uh, address sure. that? Yes, I would be happy to. So um, I you know, think back um, to when this crisis started and you know, we were all basically thrown into this uh, distance learning without much time to prepare. Um, and, you know, we, we kind of just made our way through it as best as we could. Um, and so a lot of challenges popped up early on. First of all, you know, kids were suddenly at home with parents who needed to work. You had kids who were suddenly, you know, they need, they relied to get getting their free or reduced lunch at school and suddenly the schools are closed. Um, you have parents that maybe didn't have access to technology at, at home and suddenly they need a computer. So, you know, we were fortunate in our district that, that our board has made uh, tremendous investments in technology in, in recent years. Uh, so much so that every, every kid in our, our schools in grades three through eight has their own Google Chromebook. So we made arrangements for our families to come pick up those Chromebooks so that they, they could engage in the distance learning. Uh, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of school districts weren't that fortunate we're in that position so you know I can only imagine how much harder it was um, you know we set up uh, meal pickup at our at six school sites so that our children could uh, continue to get fed and you know and one thing I'm particularly proud of is um, we didn't turn away any student we didn't you know whether you were a resident or not of our district if you showed up hungry we provided uh, you know a, a food a meal so, you know, we survived those early months and fast forward, I think we're now in, in a better place in terms of planning for what this school year uh, will look like and addressing a lot of the concerns that have cropped up uh, during that, those first months. Um, we convened a, a school reopening task force and it, it consists of something like 80 members, uh, teachers, uh, classified employees, parents, uh, community members. Uh, I'm the board representative for that. And I can tell you so much thought and, and care has gone into what this year will look like um, now you know and we can't address every concern that crops up there's a lot of concerns frankly that are not valid or not rooted in science or logic and yeah, but even those we've done our best to at least respond and, and address um, but there are still some significant challenges that we are grappling with as i know probably all of you are um, number one we, we want to get back to in-person schooling i think that goes without saying um, because our kids are missing out on socialization and, and you know the relationships they build uh, time with their teachers, um, but we're in this reality now where it's not possible. Um, but meanwhile, our parents still need to work. You know, they still need to, to make to pay their bills. Um, you know, we're not a wealthy district, uh, so we're looking at setting up childcare uh, from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, and during that childcare times, there will be computers available uh, for those that don't have it at home uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so, you know, that's one challenge we're grappling with. And obviously, again, we, we have, we're 80% of our kids are, are either on free or reduced lunch or they have English as a second language at home. So we're, again, gonna set up our, our, our meals for kids to come, their families come pick up their meals. We also need to make sure that we're distributing, uh, you know, homework or instructions, uh, training videos, whatever it is in, in multiple languages to make sure our families understand, you know, what's expected of them, what's expected of the kids, you know, how they're gonna navigate this, this process. So, you know, it, it's a challenge, of course, with deserve, diversity comes great strength, uh, but it also, you know, presents challenges that we have to, we have to take into consideration and make sure we address. So that's, that's just some uh, of the issues that we're, we're grappling uh, with right now. I don't wanna, you know, take up all the time, but bottom line is I, I think the challenges have been immense, but I really am proud of how our community has rallied together and we've just sought to, to address these challenges one by one. And I'm confident that the distance learning we're gonna provide for this upcoming school year is very robust and you know, will challenge our kids and, and you know, with the hope that we can bring them back before the year is through. 
Thank you, Jameson. And I know that those are some of the same issues that every school board is facing and you, you put them very well. Uh, was there anyone else who wanted to talk about uh, additional things that uh, they're seeing in their school boards or in their school districts, I should say? Okay, Jameson, I think you've got, oh, meals for kids, right. And that's what um, Ms. Booker put in the chat. And thank you so much for, um, for making sure that your district provided not just for the students who are already receiving it, but for others who came and were hungry. We, I know Irvine also, uh, one of our big issues was, was feeding, feeding the kids. And it was, uh, it was well attended. You know, people really showed up for that. So I'm going to go to Gina uh, Clayton Tarvin now, and I'm going to ask you what are your what is your district doing uh, to ensure the safety of students uh, while also ensuring access to education. And I know you posted some pictures, um, and I know you have a plan. I'd love for you to take a minute and talk with us about it. Sure. Um, you know what's really interesting? Um, I got a text message today from a community member and he actually provides after school programming and sports programming for our students in um in huntington beach and westminster and he said oh mg you are featured on buzzfeed and i was like what he said yeah you made it to buzzfeed your tweet is in buzzfeed i said no wonder all these you know because twitter's kind of like whoa because it just starts coming right and i guess a tweet that i had made a couple days ago with a picture of one of our classrooms that's already set up with a tremendous amount of protective gear in it um, and i can explain that in a moment but this i posted this picture and i said this is what we're doing in the ocean view school district and um you know buzzfeed picked it up and it went completely viral i mean and I, that's a you know the pun intended viral like it's it's gone out of control and i've gotten mostly positive um comments but some have been really negative in the sense that people are like you're going to kill children um this is terrible you're going to hell and i'm not joking and i think all school board members right now are feeling a little of that heat uh but you know what like i said last night at our board meeting when i had uh, some of our employees come and um, talk about wanting a raise i said you know what you can you can be upset and, and you can you can protest, you can redress, but you know what, we're in the middle of a pandemic and things are upside down. So the, the picture that I posted, let me explain it to you. It is a picture of a classroom at Hope View, actually where my third year, uh, my third grader is gonna be attending. It is the picture of one of the classrooms and it has all the desks separated. So they're at least six feet apart. And each desk has its own study corral. And teachers know what that is. It's like where you put up a little barrier around each child. You usually do that during test taking time. Um, but it's made of plexiglass. And so each child in the Ocean View School District is gonna be surrounded by their own little protective station we have purchased all of this. It's about $100,000. I put it on the agenda on July 7th. So we made the purchase. We've gotten a majority of it in the, and the rest of it comes in um, next week. And so we're, we are doing that as far as the part of the protection plan. Another part of the protection plan is to have um, the plexiglass for the teachers as well hanging. Um, each person in the Ocean View School District K, Pre-K to eight, uh, all the students and the teachers, all the staff have to wear masks at all times. We are not um, following the governor's orders, which are that little kids can take their masks off and that they don't have to wear them. I don't agree with that. I believe that every child should have it on. I think we are the only school district currently in Orange County that's mandating that, but I hope others will get on board and maybe it just takes one to do it and then others can follow. Um, so I, I would be happy to help out with that if you want to do that in your districts. Um, we're also doing daily temperature checks before kids come in the door. We're doing health screenings. Uh, we also bought electro uh, static 
um, sanitizers. I don't know if you've seen that in the uh, Channel 2. I was featured in Channel 2 a news interview by Michelle Geely yesterday, and that was shown at our school in Westminster. So I'm really proud of the plan that we have, but I do want to say this. We are not coming back until Orange County gets the all clear. The Ocean View School District has no interest in doing a waiver for K-6 because I think we should do this together as a county. Because remember, you might work in Huntington Beach or Westminster or Midway City, or you might work in Orange, but you live in Santa Ana and you live in Anaheim. And these communities have been really hard hit. And I want to make sure that we are all doing this together as one kind of big Orange County family and that we're all respecting each other. And I just want you to know that I have your backs, all of you trustees and anyone out there that's listening, and I'm happy to help you, to, to protect you, defend you in any way I can so that you can protect your, your students, you know, and your teachers and your staff, okay? So that's what we're doing. The only thing that I would consider doing um, is taking a waiver for um, SDC or um, mild to moderate classes for special education because those class sizes are already very low. So it's not a classroom with 30 kids and it. it's a classroom with five to 10 kids. So you can already have, you have the social distance built into these special day classes. And I think it's very important to make sure that we serve our special education students as best we can. So uh, right now, uh, my superintendent and deputy are lobbying the state of California to get those, um, rec those protocols to applying because apparently it's a rumor, but the governor hasn't put out the actual application yet. So I encourage all of my colleagues to go out there and lobby to get that done with Governor Newsom. Thank you so much, Gina. You've really been a leader as always. And I put up that picture while you were um, talking about what your classroom looked like so people could see. Um, it really was a uh, picture worth a thousand words, right? Um, and I know we have um, people who are personally interested. We have administrators and special ed teacher on, on our call as well today. So thank you for addressing that. Um, we had another question uh, regarding restrooms and, and how restrooms are going to be dealt with. Can you, can you answer that now, Gina? Yeah, I can. So that's part of one of our, so every district has to do a school uh, district um, protection plan and there's an attestation process that we have to go through and we're done with our plan. It's published and um, part of the plan is talking about how these sort of bathroom trips and so on will be um, done literally like how are kids going to make it out of the halls and go and not you know get to the bathroom and back safely. So most of I would say 99% of our uh, kinder and pre-K and TK and all of these early kindergarten classrooms all have bathrooms right within the classroom. So the teacher and the aides. So in Ocean View, every kindergarten teacher has an aide as well. I know that's unusual for most school districts, but we, we have a separate uh, agreement and MOU with our classified staff so that each teacher has an, an aide. So we may have to repurpose our aides and kind of while they're maybe they're going to work in the morning in the kindergarten or in the afternoon, whatever, and we're going to use them to be kind of roving. So classified, some of their job descriptions are going to be changed a little. We're going to have sort of classified folks helping our students to get to the bathrooms and back. We're going to ask parents to, you know, make sure that their kids uh, go to the restroom before they get to school. But I do want to mention, um, as a public school teacher, I am very cognizant of the fact that the ed code is very clear. No teacher can deny a child going to the restroom. And I hear this happening a lot, not just in my own school district, but where I work to in ABC, a lot of teachers will say, well, you should have gone to the bathroom before you got to school. Well, you cannot punish a child like that. You cannot not let them go to the bathroom because it's a form of corporal punishment, okay? So we can't deny children going to the, to the bathroom, but we have to be very vigilant and careful and make sure that there is um, a staff member who's at least in the hallway and watches them kind of go in and out. So we're gonna have hallway sort of bathroom, like monitors, if you will. That's, that's great. Thank you, Gina. Did, did anyone else have anything to add on um, the question of how, what their respective districts are doing to ensure the safety and continued learning of students? I mean, I think our, our district is doing something very similar. How big is your district, um, Gina, just out of curiosity? 
Um, well, it's a K to eight and it has about 9,000 kids. So with the, the kids that we have, have and that Jameson has in the Fountain Valley and Huntington Beach, if you put them all together with the high school district, it's about, it would be about 75,000 kids, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But because we're all broken up, um, I think we're the second largest K-8. Jameson's is the first largest. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody kind of has similar protocols just because they're, they're required by the state. And I think we're all, all complying with that. Um, I'm glad to hear that you are doing TK through eight with masks. I don't think we're going to get there, <laughs> but we will have, we will be complying with the third grade through 12 for sure, but we'll see how our board does. We have a meeting this Thursday, so we'll see. Uh, we had a request, we had a request that you um, go over again, the special ed um, information, but would you mind, um, it maybe we should take that, I think, at the end. I'd love to have just a special question on special ed and what that's going to look like, because I know we have a number of people here who are going to be interested in that. I'd like to go to Carrie now. Um, Carrie, what do you feel are the most pressing issues for educators, students, and families moving into the 2020-2021 school year? by far and away uh, the most emails phone calls conversations that i'm having with folks are parents who have children uh, with unique needs um i like i said i work in special education and we have i think approximately seven million uh children with um ieps in our country and it has been thus far a, a confounding experiment um, it, it'd be nice to say that we have all these kinks worked out moving into the new school year, but I think there's still kinks to work out. And I'm coming not only from the perspective of an, uh, an SLP and a provider, but I'm also coming from the perspective of a parent who has a child with unique needs. So I'm on both sides of the table, um, trying to deliver services and then trying to make sure my kid's getting his services. And that's been a challenging um, scenario. And I, I think I'm particularly sensitive and empathetic to that um, scenario. You know, um, I think our children with unique needs have had a very difficult time with remote learning. Uh, remote learning is a difficult way to deliver services. Um, certainly counseling and, and mental telehealth can be more uh, transferable in that way, but I'll just speak as a speech language pathologist. You know, it's, it's really hard to deliver services when I can't get close to a kid and I can't see how they're producing language. Uh, I can't see the articulation going on. Uh, I have got these big Coke glasses to help me. <laughs> but it is not the same as being in a room with a child. And it can be very isolating for children with unique needs. Um, they uh, oftentimes respond wonderfully when you're in that room with them and giving them that love and empathy and concern and compassion. Um, and so imagine, if you will, see a child who's on the spectrum. They may have um, sensory issues that are not being addressed. They may have speech issues not being addressed, uh, mental health issues that are not being addressed. And you try your best to deliver these services. But let me give you an, a for example. So I may have a caseload of 60 students. Let's just say in theory I have a caseload of 60 students. I cannot do a one-to-one -one back to back all day long every day because I'm trying to give uh, uh, that child their services. What we do is we'll often have two or three children with the same, if they're obviously if their IEP dictates that, they, they may say they have a list. Okay, so I can deliver services to three of those children at a time. That has presented a lot of issues um, with doing Zoom because you have privacy issues, you have uh, parenting schedules that are not in alignment, um, you have delivery for different um, SLPs at different times can be challenging. So how do you do that when, you're, when you've got 60 kids uh, trying to even manage that schedule? That's a challenge, okay? So I noticed personally with, with my son, and it's hard as a trustee, right? Because you don't want to criticize all the trustees know that, you know, if you have children in the schools, you don't want to be critical. But it, my, I could just speak for my child, his counseling services fell by the wayside because he had counseling services in IEP that were in a group, right? And we could not get that 
um, going over this last time. So it was challenging. He missed some of those services. And we had situations where uh, the you know, staffing was not the same moving into uh, the end of the year. Staffing changed when we went this way because we had parents that were you know, challenged at home and couldn't deliver services the way that they were when they were on campus. So I think that's just been a, a difficult experiment. Um, and I'd like to think that it's all worked out moving in, into the into this next school year, but I still see that there's difficulty with that. Um, and, you know, we're trying to do their best, but it, it's difficult to deliver those services. You know, education is supposed to be the great equalizing force in our community, but I feel that special ed children have kind of gotten a short end of the stick, at, stick and the, the gap for some kids widens because those services aren't delivered in the best possible medium. And so they may be going out with the best services. They haven't been getting their services in the best way possible. And so sometimes you lose social skills. If you're a child who's on the spectrum, you may lose social skills. Social skills require being in a, in a group, having social skills, interacting, um, pragmatics, eye contact, um, proximity, knowing where to sit in relation to someone else. And those subtle things are missed in, in a Zoom atmosphere. Um, we've learned, we've learned from some of the mistakes we've made, but it is an imperfect situation because it, at the end of the day, this is still an experiment. I mean, people don't wanna acknowledge that, but this is still an experiment, a great experiment. Um, so those are some of the things I'm seeing. Oh, thank you, Carrie. I really appreciate that. And I think we're, we're going to need to talk a little bit more about special needs um, as we get through some of the questions. And I know we're going to have some of that in the Q&A. Um, at this time, though, I'd like to uh, really just springboard off what you were saying and go to Chris Erickson of Orange Unified um, and asking her, Chris, can you please discuss some of these changes educators, students, and families can expect in this upcoming year? Sure. Um, I think as everybody mentioned, this was, you know, spring was sprung on us, so to speak. And everybody was scrambling. Everybody was trying to figure out how we were going to do this. We all know that every student doesn't have the same needs. Every student doesn't learn the same way. Every student has different challenges. And so now all of a sudden, all of our students were learning and receiving their education through one medium. And that created a lot of challenges, a lot of um, implications for students that, that didn't necessarily adapt well to that. I have my own daughter who really struggled you know, with the distance learning. Um, I think too, in the spring, there was sort of, because it was so sudden, there was sort of a lack of schedule, a lack of format, kind of the expectations were vague. Um, and so there was some disparity. Some teachers, I think, were able to really respond quickly and well. And, and I was really proud of our district, too. We were able to get out um, devices very quickly, get out hotspots very quickly. Um, and we were basically good to go within a few days of closing. But um, it certainly wasn't a perfect system. And I think that going into the fall, many, many parents and, and probably students as well have anxiety about that because they're looking back at spring and thinking the fall is going to be like the spring was. Um, so I will give good news that it is not going to be like that. <laughs> it is still an experiment, but there are definitely uh, the districts have created um, well, the legislature enacted um, SB 98, Education Code 43501, which mandates um, certain um, instructional minutes that has, uh, so let's see, kindergarten is 180 minutes, grades one through three are 230 minutes, and grades four through 12 are 240 minutes. So for our district, we've created, and this is just for the distance learning portion, and so by way of background, I'm assuming everybody knows we're all starting distance learning because the County of Orange is still on the monitoring list. So if anybody is not familiar with how we get off the monitoring list, we need to be off the, uh, meet certain criteria for 14 consecutive days. And then once the county has done that, and that's the positivity rate in the cases per 100,000, once we've met that, schools are able to go and return to in-person learning. And each district was responsible for coming up with their own programming for that. Um, 
so for us, we really, uh, we had the same thing. We had a task force like Jameson did in Westminster and they really did a phenomenal job and they came up with just about every choice you could want, um, which is great. I'm very happy about it, but you know, it's also going to be difficult to, to probably make happen. It's going to take a little while to get things going, but for us, um, while we're on distance learning, we have schedules. Our, our, our teachers have schedules. They are free to get waivers and teach from home, but they are having like sort of a regular school day um, schedule. That doesn't mean that they're going to be teaching live for that entire period, and it doesn't mean that students are going to be sitting at their computer for five hours in a row. Um, it's going to be much like a regular classroom where they're going to have breakout sessions. They'll have some independent learning. They will um, really sort of handle it much like they do on a regular school day. Um, we've broken up our recesses so that we have, um, instead of maybe one 20 minute um, recess or, or period, we have split it into two so that kids um, can get away, students can get away from that screen for a little while. Um, so, and we've also created it so that it's very flexible. So if things are not working or things need to be changed up, we can pivot pretty easily. And that we anticipate having to happen. Um, we are creating, so when we go back to live um, school, whenever that is, we have several options. So for our TK through six, we have either distance learning, a hybrid model, or a full in-person model. And what that's going to entail is basically we have much like um, Gina's district, we have everything set up. We've got the protection, we've got the um, panels, we've got the face masks, we've got the sanitizing stations, hand washing stations, um, everything is set up. Our, our bus um, transportation department is completely set up to sanitize buses daily, make sure that there's um, six feet between each, each um, child. And when there can't be, they have certain things in place where, where they will be protected. They're going to have to wear masks no matter what when they're on the bus. Um, will have smaller class sizes. So, so when they are in class together, there'll be smaller cohorts so that we can accommodate social distancing. Because like all of us, we are all, you know, operating in classrooms that are too small to accommodate, you know, social, social distancing and have, have 30 kids in a classroom. So uh, they're gonna be much smaller. It's going to be a challenge no doubt to keep children and especially even at the secondary level, um, Away, away from each other, you know, it's going to be a challenge and, and enforcing that needs to be, we need to be very sensitive to it and, and try to um, figure out how to not make it punitive, but also we need to enforce. And, um, you know, that's gonna, we're gonna have to take that sort of as it comes. I think some of the positive things, oh, and we also opened up a virtual academy. So grades seven through 12 have a completely dedicated virtual academy so that if they would like to just do that for the year, they can go do that and that's its own curriculum. And all of those kids are still, students are still able to participate in the extracurriculars through their homeschool. So they can still participate in sports, they can still participate in theater, whatever it is that they need to do so that they can still have that connection. Um, I think some of the positives that sort of have come out of it is, I think for us, we're now going to be a one-to-one -one district, which we were not um, before, and we will now. I think a lot of teachers um, have figured out, some of those that were a little more resistant to technology have realized that they can use the technology as a tool to help them teach and to sort of help with some of the things that... Um, you know, I had one teacher who, who said, I can't believe how much time is saved with Google Classroom um, with getting my grades out because he was still doing everything manually. He's been teaching for, you know, 30 years. And he said, you know, it's such a time saver. I can now spend more time doing what it is that I love to do, and that's teaching. Um, I think we've all been forced to have our communication within our districts improved. Um, I think that that is something that, that has been improved, at least in our district. Um, we are increasing the number of nurses that we have because that is the one, you know, medical professional that we have. And that's one of the things that I pushed for is in California, we have a terrible ratio of nurses per, per school. Um, right. We're at least getting 
three additional and we actually had a fairly decent ratio prior to that, relatively speaking. And I also think that there's a heightened um, awareness on the mental health of students. And I am hoping and pushing for getting um, additional counselors and really riding that wave. A lot of these people that are demanding to open schools are really citing the mental health of the students. And, and I, I agree with that aspect that there is definitely a, a, a um, they're suffering, you know, everybody is. It's, there's a lot of, of mental health issues um, that have been based on that. And I'm hoping that we can um, take hold of that wave and hopefully push an agenda so that we can get additional mental health counseling in all of our schools because we were desperately underfunded for that before and now the need is going to be even greater. So, um, you know, but that comes from really the, you know, the state and potentially the county as well and some funds for, from the federal government um, on the COVID relief. So, so that's, uh, that is some of the changes. Um, I think for sports, we right now, they're permitted to do conditioning, anything that can be done that can be socially distanced. Anything that can't, we're not um, doing. Most of the sports in, and athletics are gonna be taking place outside. And um, that's something that, you know, it's important to get the kids back to, together and getting um, in that, getting that in for them. So that's about it. I can't think of anything else. I had a few questions if we can. I know um, on the agenda, we're scheduled to go to Board of Ed. But that is a whole monster on its own. So <laughs> before we do that, I had a couple questions based on the panelists statements. And I'm sure we might want to have some questions. Uh, I, I feel it's great that people have been putting what they want to talk about in the chat right now. Please continue to do that so that we can uh, get the questions to the panelists. <clears throat> Now, I am a mom, and uh, my son is all raised right now, but um, we, ex we did public school, we did private school, we did homeschool, uh, because my son wasn't a real easy fit for all of the classrooms, so we had to do for him, you know, what... Uh, you know, what was, what his needs dictated. So I've, I experienced a lot of this online stuff myself. And um, I have a question about parent resources. So for me, even though my son was in junior high school when he was homeschooled, um, that was really, and he had a formal curriculum, it was really a lot of our work. And if I didn't have the community home education program, I think that was for sixth grade, I would have been lost. Do we have those kinds of resources for parents who are trying to navigate this new online uh, learning? Uh, I can start with that, Melissa. Um, we are gonna be providing a lot of resources and help to our parents and to help them navigate. We will have district staff available to take phone calls and walk them through any technical issues they may have. Um, and just because I saw this question in the chat, um, in terms of the PE curriculum, the PE requirements have been waived by the state, but we will continue to have a virtual PE, uh, you know, distance learning PE uh, time where an instructor will be with the students and help them do some physical education. So I just wanted to address that question. But to answer your question, yeah, we're, we're doing everything we can to help um, our parents navigate uh, these issues. You know, and we do have some parents that don't have internet access at home, at home, so we're providing hotspots. So we really try and do everything we can to make sure everybody participates, um, everybody has a good experience. And unlike before, when this all happened, I think we're well prepared this time around because we had plenty of time to, to work on it and make sure everyone knows what they're doing. So um, I think it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be, you know, seamless. There's going to be issues that crop up, but I think we're in a really good position. Oh, that's great. And Carrie just put in the chat that they're going to have pre-recorded services like yoga and aerobics. And I've, I've been doing a Zoom yoga class. And while it's not the same as yoga in person, it, it, it has been certainly a much needed break. Um, we've heard from other districts that there's an issue that the students have just have disappeared. 
If you don't log on, you don't know where they are, you can't communicate with them, maybe it's an issue of not having Wi-Fi, or we don't even know what the issue is. So do, is there a plan for trying to connect with students that have disappeared or who disappear mid-year? And um, how does that affect fund? How do we have a, a tie of attendance to funding? I think Gina's ready to jump on that one. I saw her hand go up. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about funding first. This year, um, there will no, be no penalization as far as school district budgets are concerned with funding. So the governor and um, the legislature have agreed, Cal Ledge have agreed that your funding for this year, 20, 21 is going to be based on your ADA or your your bodies, how many kids were in your schools pre-COVID in 1920. So we won't see any kind of, you know, punitive action or taking away of funds due to that. That's one. So we don't have to worry about that. But it really becomes uh, an issue for schools, not so much about, oh my gosh, the child isn't logging in so we don't get our money, because frankly, that's kind of weird. As educators, we shouldn't think like that. We should think about, I'm worried that kids are not logging on because one, there's something wrong in the home possibly. Okay. Two, th this child is missing out on critical education time, even if it's virtual. And three, this could go on a while, so we have to come up with a solution. And part of the solution is going to be, especially now that we're not completely in a like phase one lockdown, is we're going to have to utilize our child welfare and um, attendance departments. And when you do that, what you do is you activate your officers from that department, your, your sometimes their um, school employees, sometimes their probation officers, believe it or not, and they go out and they go and do home visits. Also principals do home visits. I, as a teacher, have done home visits. I have worked in Hawaiian Gardens for, for 10 years. I worked in Cerritos for 14. And some of my students, frankly, when I worked in Hawaiian Gardens, would go missing, okay? So after I would call and I wouldn't hear back, the parent, you know, where is this child? This is a, becomes like, where is this child, right? And so we would make a home visit after a couple days we call, of course, I called CPS like immediately because I suspected and as mandated reporters and, and Carrie Kropke can attest to this because we're both mandated reporters as teachers. When you know, when you even have an inkling, if you suspect there is abuse or neglect, you have to call CPS. And I really want to encourage other board members that are not mandated reporters legally. You don't have to be, you're not. But you know because you oversee the mandated reporters, all your employees are. Please be aware that these are critical situations where children could potentially be in peril. If they're not logging on, there could be something very wrong. And in fact, there's something very wrong just for the simple fact that they've vanished from their teacher. Um, it just happened um, in my on, so you're actually, you're in my online classroom. You're here. This is where I taught my students for, for four months. You're in it, see my flag and my globe and my little apple and every day, you know, okay. And um, we, I had to just keep the show going. The show must go on. And some of my kids didn't log in and, um, and I had to call CPS in May. I'll leave it at that. I, I just want to say, um, Melissa, you know, some of the information we were getting back with our last experiment prior to going into this year is we had about one in three children uh, were having connectivity issues, right? Um, and we've done our best, I think, of, of distributing Chromebooks. A lot of districts have done that. But just because a child has a Chromebook doesn't mean, indeed, that they're able to access internet. We sometimes um, forget that many things have to happen for internet. Uh, credit checks, uh, identification, uh, things that sometimes we just go, okay, well, it, it should be easily accessible. Spectrum's offering a discount. Some of the things that we, I think, take for granted uh, can be impediments. 
let me tell you specifically about some of the children in my high school. Uh, their parents lost jobs. And so one student would have to go to Las Vegas to live with the other parent because they had a job and they were having food insecurity with, with parent A uh, versus parent B. So that child would go to Las Vegas. Um, and I've had students that are riding buses during the day to get to one place to another. Poverty is a real impediment to education in this scenario. I know that I've been very in the minor compared to some folks about grading during a pandemic. Um, I was very vocal about that. I think it is <laughs> grossly unfair when you are expecting children um, to perform at the same level that they would if they're in a classroom with teachers, with oversight, with principals, with people who are there surrounding them versus maybe their parents are working two and three shifts, working graveyard, um, um, putting food on the shelves at the grocery store, um, trying to pick up extra, extra shifts. So sometimes the things we're thinking about, well, kids are just not doing it. There's so many layers that go behind that of why they're not doing it. For the most part, we know as trustees or parents, children, for the most part, are engaged in education. They like school for the most part. They like their peers. They like learning. And um, there are many things that happen to students that make it difficult for them. And, and they're weathering the storm, you know? So um, I know that as a SLP, I had many students who were having access problems just getting online with me to Zoom. So uh, some of the things when we get out on the dais, it's hard. We, we forget about that. And our superintendent isn't really communicating that to us. But as a teacher, as a speech language pathologist, I'm the one making the phone calls. And if I'm having difficulty connecting, there's a real issue. And that it's incumbent upon me to, I snail mailed. I, I snail mailed. I emailed. I called. And I know our districts are doing better jobs of following up, starting with the teachers themselves making the phone calls, daily check-ins. Um, if, if students don't check in, then a teacher, it's incumbent upon a teacher to make the phone call. And after two, then it goes up to our attendance clerk. And after that, so we put in these different levels of uh, protections and supports uh, to get our kids online. Um, but I know that is a real struggle that sometimes we take for granted. I, you know, I, I'm addicted to Diet Coke. A lot of people know that. <laughs> a lot of my friends on here know that. And uh, I drive to Del Taco and I get my Diet Coke every day. Well, there's one of my high school students who works there. And she's working two shifts there. So we have this expectation that that child is supposed to get the same grades that she did when she was work in high school full time, but she's picked up two shifts because her mom is now working two and a half jobs cleaning uh, homes. So what it is, it is incumbent upon us to have compassion for our students and understand that there is, there is a lack of equity in these scenarios at times. Thank you so much, Carrie, for talking about that. I, I really appreciate it. And this is why I put this group together. And this is why I reached out to this group in particular, people who have been really leaders in the community on education issues. And so I'd like to talk to you about the last point on, um, I would like you to share your thoughts on the recent actions in the Orange County Board of Education and how your respective districts are personally responding and what your thoughts are. Go ahead and unmute, Gina. <laughs> okay. Um, so when the Orange County Board of Education, who, by the way, have zero say over any school district or board, local board of trustees. So school districts are LEAs, local enforcement agencies. They function like any kind of local jurisdiction that's independent under California state constitution, we have local control. The Orange County Board of Education has zero to say about what we do in our local school districts. Thank goodness, thank goodness. Because they are a group of absolute derelicts. They are totally irresponsible. They are interested in uh, pushing their agendas, which are alt-right, right-wing, um, absolutely outside of the mainstream, can't even say they're Republican. They're not. They are beyond the Tea Party. They're out to, out to pasture, out to lunch. I don't know where they are, but they are not for kids. And they created this white paper 
oh boy, like that means nothing. You can burn it. There's white paper. And um, in this white paper, they said, um, well, we don't want, kids shouldn't come to school with masks and kids shouldn't have barriers and kids, there should be nothing, no social distancing and our kids should be free. Yes, free to spread like vector because children are vector, as you know. I've been in a classroom 24 years. You know how many times I've been sick from kids? Probably 124. So the point is, is that children are vector and if you don't have them protected and the staff protected and protected from each other, you're going to have spread, unmitigated spread, viral spread. And so the Orange County Board of Education made this white paper that said that kids shouldn't be protected. And so I immediately, that day, uh, was contacted by several news agencies and I went everywhere on every news station you can imagine, every newspaper, and I just blasted them. I just said, you're, you're done. Nope, you're not gonna spread your lies here in Orange County. And you know what? We won. Chris, Jameson, Carrie, Melissa, all of the all of us that care about children, we were victorious in that one because we stopped them in their tracks. Their paper means nothing. There you go. Well, it has been very disappointing that there have been others uh, in the districts. Um, parents that will cite the Board of Education as authoritative. Um, it is also um, so important. I'm so glad that you let people know that they don't have direct authority over the schools, but they do have authority over charter schools, is my understanding. It, 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 how, what kind of, that's a question. No, they what kind of authority do they have over private and charter schools? Okay, so they have no authority over private schools at all, and they have little authority over charter schools too, because each charter school has its own board, and they make their decisions for their students. Um, and I'm by far no, I am no proponent of charter schools. I think most folks know that about me. I'm, I'm not. But I will say that each charter school has its ability to make its decisions for its own students. And I haven't heard, except for a couple of these charters that are run by these kind of out to lunch folks, are wanting to do this. Um, I do want to say though, and I want to give Chris a lot of credit because she was alerting people to the fact that even though the Orange County uh, Board of Education doesn't have the authority, their authority is almost minimal. They do very little. And I could tell you in a, in a little bit, I'll come back and tell you the list of what they actually do oversee. But Chris was alerting people to the fact that, you know what, they're dangerous for a really, really um, critical reason because people believe their nonsense. They think they have authority and perception is right. so critical. So Chris was out telling people and I saw her post and, and you know what, Chris was right. She was a voice saying, you know what, we've got to stop. And she helped to rally folks to send in public comments and literally to over 2000 pu public comments in opposition to the Orange County Board of, of Education. So I wanna give Chris Erickson a lot of credit on leading that charge. And we're, get, we're closing in on the end. I think we got our questions all in the chat, but um, we did have a request for um, a restatement of the policies for special education. And um, uh, would you mind going back over that, Gina? Sure, um, just really briefly. Here's the thing. Each school district has the ability currently to um, call to the California Department of Public Health and ask, and the county as well, the Orange County Healthcare Agency, our local uh, healthcare agency with the officer Clayton Chow, Dr. Chow, to be able to um, ask about what are the procedures for getting a waiver for special education for, my, sorry, for moderate to severe classes, special day. SDC classes. So it wouldn't be for RSP kids and it wouldn't be for kids that are mainstreamed. It would just be for the SDC. And supposedly, this is what I, I talked to, I had a conversation with uh, my superintendent this morning, my employee, Dr. Carol Hansen, and I asked her, what is the update? She said, you know, we asked weeks ago and the governor doesn't really have that part of it together. And we like Governor Newsom. I don't want to make this about like we're upset at him, but it was said and then there was no follow through. So there's no specific waiver process right now for special ed. There's a waiver for K-6 and that's something Ocean View's not gonna go for because I don't think that's the right path. But 
if you have your boards, the, the three that are here, and any uh, resident that's listening, uh, any person who's concerned, please write a letter to your school board um, and to your superintendent and let them know that you know that there is a waiver process out there of for special ed potentially to go back and that you'd like your board and your superintendent to look into that. And so you can kind of put the pressure on your elected officials to check into that. And I also want to shout out Judge uh, Lynn Riddle, who yes. has worked tirelessly with the Board of Education on outing them and challenging them and sunlighting everything that they're doing. Um, I want to take this, this time to just thank these champions of education who are putting so much work and effort into keeping us safe, our kids safe, getting back to school, keeping education going. Um, I know that the public doesn't always um, see what school boards do. So I'm actually glad now that um, residents and uh, parents are getting an opportunity to see what slayers you guys are and how hard you're working because every one of you is a rock star. And thank you so much for giving of your time. I'm gonna post this on YouTube. And so as we, um, as we transition out of this meeting, I'm gonna say goodbye, but I want this to be our last image. This is the Ocean View classroom, and hopefully we can go back to this. And do you know how much effort went into, into just putting all of this together? So thank you all so much. Have a great night and take care. Thank you again. Thank, thank you, Melissa. You. Thanks, Melissa. This was really, this was great. Thank you. Have a great school opening. Thank you, Melissa. Take care now. Love you, Melissa.